Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our session on the hack chain, where we're all going to learn to think like a hacker. So we wanted to get the year off to a good start by giving you the opportunity to learn these new practical skills for free and give you a taster of what our training programs are like. The session will last 90 minutes. We'll have a Q&A. Your microphones will be on mute throughout. So just add your questions to the chat and we'll ask them. Any that we don't get to today, we'll share in a recorded Q&A on our social media channels panels later in the week. Um, throughout the day, we're going to be asking some big questions on cyber and information security on our LinkedIn and Twitter. Anybody who joins the conversation, leaves a comment, gets involved or leaves us a Google review today will be put into a, um, a random draw to win a Madlog tech backpack. And we've shared a link in the chat there so you can have a look at those. Your trainer today is going to be Sean Hanna. He's the founder of Nemstar um, with lots and lots of experience in the industry and as a trainer and he is an EC Council award-winning trainer. So if you're ready to think like a hacker, let's go. Sean, it's over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Johan. Uh, and just if you do get a wee chance, uh, Madlog, the prize for today, it's a local charity. They, they do uh, lots of different gifts based on it. So even if you don't aren't interested in joining, maybe you could check out their website. So, hello, welcome in. This is a session, as Johan says, learn to think like a hacker. It is the hack chain. My name is Sean Hanna. I'm the founder uh, and owner of an uh, information security consultancy business here in uh, the UK. We specialize in information security training. We promised that these sessions would be free from sales and marketing. So I'm going to try to keep my word on this. So we're going to simply jump straight in to the content that you're here to see today. OK, um, my background. OK, and we were just done the first session of today's free training January. Uh, the first session was about, you know, how do I break into information security and what background do I need? My, my background is quite traditional. I had a technical background in Microsoft operating systems, Active Directory and Exchange. I was also a, a department head in a large multinational organization. So my background is, is management and technology. And, and that's really what I'm bringing in here. Uh, we introduced uh, the Certified Ethical Hacking Program into the Europe in 2002 and three. And I am one of the EC Council master trainers on this subject. That means that we help the EC Council develop their course where we train other trainers and we do their, their product launches. So this material, it's from the CEH version 11. I actually did the global launch with CEH version 11 with the EC Council back in September time. So hack chain. OK, so what really is this about? Some two, OK? Don't know if you've ever read The Art of War. It's a logistics handbook, OK? It's the start of many sort of management handbooks. And some two in The Art of War, I think it was uh, 300 BC, he wrote some things about the military, about how a military should be orchestrated. Now, we're not military, but we can learn from his teachings. And he said, if you know the enemy, and know yourself. You need not fear the results of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gain, you will also suffer a defeat. And if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. We fight a battle every day to protect our business to protect our stakeholder and shareholders' interests, to protect our customer data, our employee data, to make sure that our business can continue, survive and thrive. And that's what it feels like these days. It feels like we're battling. It feels as if every single day we wake up to a new challenge from a very innovative, very skilled and capable enemy. Hack chain, certified ethical hacking, pen test. Why do we bother learning it? Because for us to successfully defend our system, there are two things 
You must absolutely know. You must know your own network, your own technology stack, how you operate. You must know your own infrastructure, your network design, your cloud ecosystem. You know, do you use Kubernetes or you, do you use Docker? What sort of cloud orchestration are you? Cloud centric or cloud neutral? Okay. Is it IP4 or IP6? What vendors firewalls do you implement? What's your AV solution? The first thing, we have to understand our own systems and our own networks. Then to effectively defend we then need to understand what the enemy is capable of. We need to understand how they approach this problem. They want to gain access to your network. They want to gain access to your information. They want to blackmail you. They want to ransomware you. They want to socially engineer. They want to install payloads and backdoors and create botnets out of your systems. They want to make a profit from hacking our systems. And if we're going to defend, then we really need to understand how a hacker thinks. If we can understand how the hacker thinks and the process that they use, then, then and only then, we have a chance of defending the network. And Sun Tzu's quote, it's absolutely valid. I've been working in IT for over 25 years and information security for almost 20 years now. And I've seen this time and time again. I have seen companies with excellent technical staff who try to defend themselves against an unknown enemy and they fail. Because when they're protecting this part, the enemy's somewhere else. You see, there's a thing called threat intelligence. And threat intelligence is a really important concept in modern information security and cyber defense. Threat intelligence says, look, we have a limited budget. We have a limited team. We are restricted in what we can do. So we have to make sure that we apply that limited budget, that limited amount of time and that limited team effectively and we should be deploying about the things that are actually happening now instead of the things that might happen we should be protecting ourselves against the latest attacks the attacks that the hackers are carrying out today and if we can do that we can stretch we can stretch our thin budget maybe enough to protect the business. Look, if you work for the military, if you're trying to defend GCHQ, the NSA, you literally have an unlimited budget and unlimited resources. And it is quite easy to defend a network if you don't have restrictions. But we do. You know how hard a budget is to come across. You know how hard good staff are to find. You know how hard it is to get anything signed off. So we need to understand more than ever now how the hackers operate, the processes that they do, and the goal is to make sure our defenses are strong where they need to be, where the attackers are attacking. So let's just start a little bit of a story. It's, it, it's sort of like a, a 90 minute story today. Okay. And it's going to be what exactly is a hack? So I did what we all do. I Googled it. Any attempt to gain unauthorized access to a computer, computing system or network with the intent to disable, disrupt or destroy or control computer systems, or to alter, block, delete, manipulate, or steal the data held within these systems. A cyber attack can be launched from anywhere by any individual or group, courtesy of techtarget.com. It sounds boring. 
It sounds ludicrous, Lee Boy. I looked at it and went, geez, if I had a read that, I don't know if I would have actually started a career in this. Must be more interesting than this. You see, the definition of what a hack is, is not actually that interesting. But how they accomplish it, the steps that they take, the modus operandi of the hacker is incredibly interesting. You see, I'm interested in two things, if you like, right? I'm interested as a security architect and a security consultant on two really important things I want you to think about today. And, and you, you know it's going to be a TLA, don't you? A three-letter acronym. TTPs and IOCs. So what are, what is a TTP and what is an IMC? The TTP of a hacker is the modus operandi, the tactics, the techniques, and the procedures. Hackers deploy different ways of attacking networks. They all follow the same general principles, but each group of hackers, uh, we call them APTs, Advanced Persistent Threat Groups, each APT group has a different modus operandi. They've got signatures, telltale things that one crew do that the other crew doesn't. And if we understand the TTPs, the tactics, the techniques, and the procedures that hackers deploy, we're in a better position to defend ourselves. The other thing that we'll learn today is the IOCs, the indicators of compromise. We need to watch out. We need to check. We need to continuously be vigilant to find out if someone's attacking the network and if they've been successful or not. IOCs are indicators of compromise. Think of it as a burglar alarm for your network and your systems. If you were going to build a burglar alarm, a detective control, what would you look for? If you understand the TTPs, then you already have a head start. You're looking for the tactics, techniques and procedures that are commonly deployed. When you go and do antivirus, a SIEM, a firewall, and uh, IDS, and IPS, and XDR, a SOAR, all these detective controls, they all work on IOCs. So when we're doing this today, I want you to have a little think throughout the session, TTPs and IOCs. TTPs are what the hacker do, IOCs are little telltale signs that someone's trying to get in or has successfully got into your network. You see, I want to break it down to a story, and this is exactly what we do in the Certified Ethical Hacking course. We spend five days doing this one single story. This is the hack chip. It's what we're here to cover today. You see, most people talk about this. Most people talk about a hack. But there's no such thing. A hack is a number of individual steps carefully put together by a threat actor or threat actor group. The hack itself is the final step. If we try to concentrate on that, it's extremely difficult because to get to there, the hackers go through reconnaissance, vulnerability analysis, weaponization into an exploit, and they use the exploit to deliver payload. We are here today to cover each of these one at a time. Only when we cover each of them will we be able to understand what we've set out to discover. What is a hack? So let's jump straight in and let's look at the very first one of these, reconnaissance. Again, you'll find a lot of the terminology is taken from the military and I don't know if you're militaristic or not, but you don't have to be to use the terminology. If you're going to deploy a military unit into an active theater, then the first thing you must do is gather intelligence. 
we're sitting at the moment in a situation where Russia has amassed troops on the border of Ukraine and all the Western and NATO countries are running around trying to gather intelligence. Reconnaissance. We don't know if they're serious or not, but we must gather intelligence. Reconnaissance is exactly the same for a hacker. Reconnaissance is the very first step on what the other hacker is going to do, the TTPs. Reconnaissance is about discovering the target. The hacker doesn't know who you are, where you are. They don't know your IP address range. They don't know the date and time if you're in a different time zone. Reconnaissance is, it's like feeling about in the dark, trying to discover who this target actually is. Reconnaissance consists of uh, network scanning, port scanning, and fingerprinting. We get tools like the famous Nmap that help us do this. Reconnaissance is it's not even really a criminal act. If it's a bank job we're going to do, then reconnaissance would be casing the joint out. It would be sitting outside the bank across the road in a coffee shop for two or three weeks beforehand, sipping your coffee, taking notes. When does it open? When does it close? How many police patrols go past? What's the CCTV like? What's the traffic situation? Reconnaissance isn't really a crime until the crime has been committed. You have to prove intent. So the first stage is really quite open. Let's go and have a quick peek at some reconnaissance systems. If I press that, we should have changed to a different view. Allows me to sit down and to do a demo for you. Now, what we have is some machines to do demos. Now, I know these machines are out of date but I'm running lots and lots of resources on my computer. And these systems are old, they're small, they're light, they're easy to run. Plus, I don't have to pay for the latest hacks and the latest compromises. Hacking a XP or a 2003 machine is exactly the same process as hacking a Windows 2019 or Windows 11 computer. The Certified Ethical Hacking Program last week we compromised the Windows 11 machine with the very, very latest updates and the very latest versions of Microsoft Windows Defender, bypassing them all. So the demo still holds fast. Reconnaissance is trying to find out information about a target system, and reconnaissance actually starts on the internet. It starts with simple things like who is and DNS and NS lookup. If I jump into dnsquery.org, it's a lovely little website. All it really does is give me a graphical user interface to the command line NSLOOKUP. I can go and stick in target information. I can go and target our own website because that's completely valid and legal. OK, target my own website and I should be able to find information about it. And you can see this one. No information because I've removed it and try to make it difficult for the hacker to do. If I want to go and have a look, I can go and try other things. So instead of trying that one, we can try a much easier one. We can do a DNS record query to see can we locate the server. It's just standard name resolution that allows me to get the IP address information. OK, and this one actually failed on me on this one because it didn't go down far enough but it divulges the IP address. If we get inside a network or inside a system, reconnaissance becomes a little bit more technical. Reconnaissance could be running Nmap scans against the system to discover the IP addresses and the systems that are online. So let me just very quickly configure an IP address for myself. Okay, and we can run commands with Nmap like a, an SP for 192.168.200 dot star. And what it will try to do, uh, yep, nmap is a brand new command. Okay, I'm going to use the older command, nmap, typo, typo. 
<laughs> OK, so if I run the nmap command, what it will try to ascertain on this little virtual network is what targets I have available. It'll try to go round and ascertain all the machines that are live. A network scan, really basic reconnaissance. And you can see it's reporting back that I've got a target called 200.1 and I have a target called 200.2. And there is only three machines in the virtual network. So you've got the hacker box 100, you have a machine 2.2 and 200.1. My reconnaissance would then continue to try to find a way on to any of those systems. A port scan. An Nmap is a very accomplished port scanning tool. OK, there are many switches that we could use. We'll use the most basic one. This is the TCP three-way handshake. So what I'm going to do is a simple, oh, uh, is a simple uh, T5, yeah, that's the number, T5 uh, minus capital O. So what we're trying to do is to scan this computer remotely to find if there are any open ports. An open port, all network connections are done through an IP address and a port. If a port is open, it does not mean I can hack it, but it means I can connect. And connecting is the first stage in being able to compromise the system. If a computer has no open ports, there is no possible way that I can connect to it. And you can see this machine, which it's telling me is a Windows Server 2003 Service Pack 1 or Service Pack 2 machine, has got lots and lots of juicy open ports. Each one of these ports runs a service. It makes a service available for a user. 53 is DNS, 25 is email, 80 is the internet, 88 is Kerberos, when you log on to your Active Directory domain controller. We go and we learn what each port does, and we can look up vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities on each port that we can connect to. If I can connect to a port, if the port has a vulnerability, then I might be able to compromise the machine. I'm only in step one. There'd be two more steps to hold to be able to attack it. To attack it, I need to know exactly what it's running. And you'll notice is there's a little bit of difference there. There's lots of scripts and other things that I can do to try to define what's running. One of the things I could try to do was called a banner grab. I could tell net to a port that we've discovered that's open, like port number 25, email. And if it connects to email 200, oh, sorry, wrong IP address. It's the computer I'm trying to hack is one. I'm 100. I'm, trying to, I'm not trying to hack myself. I'm trying to hack one. So if we could cross, we can get a banner. And you can see it's actually telling me that this computer is a domain controller from acme.com. You can see that there, that it's a Microsoft mail service. And this is really useful. It tells me lots of things about the version, about the service pack, and tells me things about the hotfix. So this has given me a lot of information about the remote system. This is all reconnaissance. Reconnaissance tries to tell me what the server is, the IP address range, and the ports that potentially I could try to attack. One of the most common ports to attack would be Windows File Share. And if you know your Windows computing, you will know that there are two file share ports, 139 and 445. If you connect to a share on a Windows computer, you connect over either the old port 139 or the newer, more modern 445. Those are my file share ports. Reconnaissance is gaining information about a target system. Reconnaissance itself may not even be illegal. 
because you're just probing a system, you're gathering information, you're not causing any harm, you're not causing any damage. It is not illegal to sit with a cup of coffee across the room from a bank every day for a week. You'd have to prove that it's my intent. We cannot prove the intent that Russia and Putin has at the moment. We can try to gather intelligence, but we don't know why they've amassed 100,000 troops. You see, it's not a crime, it's not illegal until something actually happens. Reconnaissance. The first step in hacking is recon. We can do it on a network with tools like Nmap. We can do it on the internet with things like DNS query. We even have ways to target IoT. The internet of things gets really interesting when you start targeting the internet of things. CCTV cameras, uh, industrial control systems, air conditioning units, solar panels, wind farms, industrial sluice gates. Uh, the attack that they did in America on Texas uh, in August, Allegedly, it was carried out by a Russian APT, an Advanced Persistent Threat Group, and the Russian group took out a Texan oil pipeline. The oil pipeline was IoT. It was not computers as we know them. It was industrial technology connected to the internet. And that pipeline supplied 80% of all fuel to New York State. New York State ran out of petrol. There was queues outside petrol stations. Petrol had to be rationed to the ambulance services and to doctors and nurses and policemen so they could get to work. IoT is just as much a target than a server, a cloud or a client. Step one, reconnaissance. Gather information about your target system, work out who they are, work out your adversary, work out as much as you possibly can. Because the next step is to find a weakness, a vulnerability. My favourite example of vulnerabilities has to be Superman. Good old Clark Kent. The original one. You see, Superman only had two vulnerabilities. Can you remember what they were? Two vulnerabilities? Clark Kent? Kryptonite? Yep, yeah, Kryptonite, you're right. What was the other one? Lois Lane. He fell in love. He was vulnerable to the charms of Lois Lane and he was vulnerable to Kryptonite. If he wasn't, if Superman had no vulnerabilities. He would have been invulnerable. And the franchise would have been really boring. Because if Superman had been invulnerable, no attack would ever have worked. And you'd have known the outcome of every story before it started. You see, the reason why bad actors can take advantage of your network, can hack it, is because you have weaknesses, you have vulnerabilities. The goal of reconnaissance is to gather information about a target. The more information I gather, the more vulnerabilities I can discover. What is it that Lex Luthor did in the Superman movie? He gathered information, he did reconnaissance, he had to research Superman and find out that Clark Kent was Superman's alter ego and Clark Kent was in love with Lois Lane. He had to find out that Superman was vulnerable to kryptonite. Vulnerability research is really big business. And I mean that. This is a multi-million pound business. It is technically difficult to do. You're looking for mistakes in code, in processes, in protocol, in people, in design. You're looking for mistakes that other people have missed, teams of other people have missed. These 
are vulnerabilities. And there's one vulnerability we're all terrified of, the dreaded zero day. You see, it's a race. Our goal is to find them and to fix them before the hackers find them. It's a them and a us, a good actor and a bad actor. If a good actor finds a vulnerability, they do responsible disclosure. Responsible disclosure. They, they tell the government, they tell the manufacturer and nobody else. And they give the manufacturer a chance to develop the antidote, the cure, the vaccine, the patch. And what we do is we tell people we found this bad thing and here is the vaccine, the cure, the antidote. What we're worried about is when a bad actor finds it, because this is, as we see it, a multi-million dollar business. Let me prove it to you. Now, this is not going to go in to the dark, deep internet. We're not going to go to the dark web or the deep web. We're just going to use Google because this is Zerodom. It's a premium exploit acquisition platform where they will buy off you vulnerabilities because vulnerabilities are a multi-million dollar business. Companies like Rapid7, uh, uh, Rapid and I mean, Core Impact, uh, GFI, there are a lot, HP, there are companies out there that sell vulnerabilities. Good companies, good actors. Vulnerability scanning systems, I need a vulnerability scanner, and if I buy one from Rapid7, Rapid7, the reason why I pick them is because they have the best vulnerability researchers, and their database has more vulnerabilities than anybody else. May not have, I'm just giving an example, not selling you any one vendor. So what are these worth? This is just the valid, genuine internet. How much do you think these are worth? Well, let's go and find out. Because if it's a Windows, server or desktop zero click it's one million us dollars one single vulnerability on a windows server or client is a million us dollars because if i can find a vulnerability like superman's vulnerable to kryptonite then we can weaponize it and i can turn it into a hack and the security research companies can sell you updates to their vulnerability scanning database, both good actors, bad actors, and state actors. The government buys just as many of these as anybody else. The NSA and the GCHQ, the Chinese military, the Russian military, uh, the SVR. Okay, they all buy these, and that's only Windows. Because guess what? If it was an Android, it would be worth 2.5 million. And if it was on iOS and Apple, 2 million US dollars. Vulnerabilities are bought and sold. Vulnerabilities are bought and sold because to a hacker, it's research and development. Weapons, research and development. And the thing about the internet, isn't that a great meme? Don't you love that? Okay, it just tells us what our job is. Every time we find one vulnerability and we fix it, what do they do? They find another and another and another. Because what was new on the internet six months ago is obsolete today. And we keep reinventing the internet. You know, uh, data centers are dead. The cloud was the new data center. The cloud is dead. Long live 5G. Okay, so if you're still moving to the cloud, you're too late. The game's moved on. We're going to be implementing 5G based cloud, which gives us a whole new ecosystem, a whole new protocol, a whole new platform. We fix, they move. And technology reinvents itself again and again and again. And human beings write it. Human beings make mistakes. It's human nature. We all make mistakes. Finding vulnerabilities, incredibly difficult. 
going through the code, doing static and dynamic analysis. You know what? If you find these vulnerabilities, you probably deserve your one, two, or two and a half million dollars because it's very, very difficult. Vulnerability research. We've got open source intelligence, manufacturers update, commercial sources. You've got the dark web and private forums. There is a good actor and bad actor market selling this information. Where's your source for vulnerabilities? Do you subscribe to vulnerability scanners like Nessus, Rapid7, Core Impact, GFI, Landguard? There are hundreds and hundreds. Do you? Are you a hacker? Are you in the dark web and on forums? Is it the Russian mafia updating you on the latest vulnerability? One example is RCE, another example is a supply chain. RCE is remote code injection. It allows me to connect to a port like my demo. And if that port has a vulnerability and the vulnerabilities of type RCE, it allows me remotely to take code and get your server to run it, your cloud server, your data center server, your web server. It allows me to remotely connect and get your server to run code. Very technical attack. But the biggest attack we have ever seen on the planet, full stop, sunburst and solar winds. When APT29, fancy burr, aka the Russian SVR, Russian military intelligence, took out 250 United States public sector departments, including the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Energy, and the Department of Health. 250 American public sector utilities hacked by the Russian government in December 2020. How that didn't start World War III, I have no idea. Maybe it still will. It wasn't an uber technical RCA. It was a supply chain attack. The Russian government didn't hack the Americans. They didn't hack 30,000 companies around the world. They hacked one vendor. They hacked a vendor, a vendor who you bought software from, who you trusted, and they put their exploit inside a security patch. You went to the vendor's website, the real vendor's website. You downloaded the security patch, the real security patch. And it contained Russian government code. Don't forget, not all vulnerabilities are technical. Supply chain is one of the really important vulnerability sources these days. You can look with a network scanner. We can use the brilliant Zap HUD to look on websites. We can look at GitHub and we got things like Getty Leaks, which allows me to scan GitHub websites for code for target systems because lots of coders upload their code to GitHub to develop it. If hackers can get access to that, they can look through the code and define weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Vulnerability analysis, vulnerability scanning, multi-billion dollar industry around the world. One vulnerability I want to draw your attention to is an old one. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pay a huge amount of money to do a demo of hacking Windows 2019 or Windows 11. It's a free session, so the exploits I will use were out of date, because the other thing is as well, I can't explain to people how to commit criminal acts on a live session. So I would remind you that if you do do this on a system, it must be your system. Doing this on any system that you do not own is a criminal act. You need prior written consent. I'm doing this on my own systems and I'm doing it on really old code for that purpose. So let me show you how easy this is because we could target this quite easily. If I know, if I know that the target is a Windows 2003 Service Pack 1 system. And if I know it's running FileShare, I need to know the protocol for FileShare. Port 139 and 445, the FileShare protocol in Microsoft 
is SMB, server messaging blocks. So if I look for SMB and I look for vulnerability, I can use Google to help me do my vulnerability research. And we can see one of these vulnerabilities is an MS-08. This is the Microsoft website. This is fixable. There is a vaccine. There is an antidote and patch available. But then we know there are anti-vaxxers out there, aren't there? There are people out there who do not patch and update their systems the same way as they don't patch and update themselves. MS-08067 is a remote code execution vulnerability. And it's Microsoft that's telling me all the information about it because Microsoft is trying to help you fix it. And I want to see, have we got, oh, Windows 2003. Ah, there we go. Look for all supported versions of Windows 2003, including SP1. So this vulnerability, it looks like this server has it. If it was Service Pack 3, it would be patched. But we think the server is Service Pack 1 from our reconnaissance. Vulnerability research is to find a vulnerability in a system because, just like Lex Luthor, if you can find a vulnerability, then maybe, just maybe, we can exploit it. A bulletin, MS08, the server service in Windows. Zero day, hackers find it, no patch, no cure. That's when the bad actor finds it before the good actor does. A zero day, COVID-19. We didn't know about it until it was circulated. We had no time to prepare for it. That's what a zero day in computing is. There's no defense at the first point. We quickly do research, we quickly produce a vaccine, but we're always playing catch up. Zero day attacks are terrifying because the hacker does not do responsible disclosure. They go and sell it to the Russian Mafia. They sell it to a state actor. They weaponize the vulnerability instead of patching it and fixing it. Reconnaissance leads to vulnerabilities. If we find weaknesses, chinks in your armor, we try to weaponize it. Knowing that Superman is vulnerable to kryptonite is absolutely pointless. Unless you've got one of these. It's a marker, I know, but let's just pretend. What colour was kryptonite? That was green, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, so it's no good knowing Superman's vulnerable to kryptonite unless you can get a piece of kryptonite. We have to take a vulnerability and weaponize it. That's what a hacker wants to do. A vulnerability without an exploit. Lex Luthor knowing he's vulnerable to kryptonite, but not having kryptonite. That's not really that dangerous. Vulnerabilities are weaponized into an exploit. Exploits, delivery methods, remote code execution, harmless. SQL injection, harmless. Cross-site scripting, harmless. Cross-site request forgery, harmless. These things that you think are dangerous are harmless. In actual fact, ICBMs are also harmless. See, you, 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 you've got it wrong. ICBMs, these things, intercontinental ballistic missiles. And there you go. Kim Jong-un is wrong. ICBMs are actually harmless. Because they are. Because this, this is your ICBM. That's the ICBM. And the ICBM is a delivery method. What bit is dangerous? The only bit that's actually really dangerous is this little bit here. The pointy bit that screws on top which of course is called the warhead or the 
You see, these things that most of us think are dangerous, like RCAs, cross-site scripts, SQL injections, cross-site request forgeries, all these things, they're harmless, really, because all they do is deliver a payload. And it's the payload that's actually dangerous. Up here, you get a conventional weapon, a nuclear weapon, a chemical weapon, a biological weapon, or even a hybrid payload. Some of the most disgusting weapons ever developed by humanity. When we combine different payloads together to give us a greater kill ratio. Hackers use exploits to accomplish their goals. The exploits themselves are merely a delivery mechanism that will deliver the dangerous part of the attack. Well, vulnerabilities are weaponized into exploits. Exploits deliver different payloads. Exploits can be denial of service that take you offline. They could be SQL injection on the internet. Every vulnerability has its own exploit, and we get classes of them, dozens of different types of them. You get an ICBM, you get a hypersonic missile, you get a nuclear device in a briefcase. There are different ways of delivering it, different categories, and exactly the same way to the weapon system, we have different categories of exploits that will all deliver payloads on behalf of a hacker. So this MS-08067, somebody took the vulnerability and, and there's what we, what we don't want to see, it was weaponized. Somebody weaponized the vulnerability. Now, why do I use out-of-date systems? Because I'm doing demos. Because this is obviously a free session. I'm not going to spend money in doing a free session. Sorry to disappoint. But watch, if I go to the internet, and where do you see how well Google knows me, right? Google knows an awful lot about you, doesn't it? If I type in the Microsoft patch, where do you see what Google suggests as its first search for me? I wonder, does it do the same for you? I hope not, because it's suspicious if it does. If I do MS 08 067, what's the first things that comes up for me? Exploit, Metasploit, Exploit GitHub, Exploit without Metasploit, Exploit DB. You see, if we know what to search for, Exploit, and if I know what to look for in an exploit, like uh, MSF, I can search using Google to find exploit code. Now I need to look at where it is. Here's one on GitHub, which is a good source of these. Okay, other ones as well. I might even target a Pacific system. One of my places is exploit DB. So if I go to exploit DB for MSF, these are the exploit codes. This is the actual exploit code to carry out the RCA. You can actually see the assembly levels. These are the rets and the scratches, the return addresses and the scratch pads and memory. We have to cover it to this level of detail when we do a certified ethical hacking course. We have to get you into reading these like they're English. OK, and you can look and you can read. These are the actual attacks and the attacks that we get. We don't download them as executables or zip files. We page script. They are page scraped off the internet, off the dark web, or if it's a very modern system, you have to buy them, buy them off the dark web. And you can pay anything from $250 to a quarter of a million dollars plus. It depends how big the target is. But this is the code for an old system because it should have been patched years ago. So the reason why we can find it is it should have been fixed years ago. Finding vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities lead hackers directly to exploits. 
exploits can be found or purchased on the internet and we do vulnerability research to find the exploit. The exploit, the goal of the exploit is the payload. The payload, the warhead, the dangerous part of the attack. The reason why we did reconnaissance was to find vulnerabilities so that we could weaponize it into an exploit. The reason why we do exploits to deliver payloads. Payloads are the dangerous part of the attack. The pointy bit that goes on top. OK, this is a multi warhead payload. OK, several nuclear devices and the one ICBM. These actually are the dangerous weapon. They give me. Well, it depends what I want to do. In the same way as an ICBM, I can choose a nuclear, a chemical, a biological or a conventional explosive or even a hybrid. I get choices depending what I want to do. I could have a command shell on your computer. I could have a command line on your computer to remotely control it, to remotely access it. I could have a command line over HTTPS across the Internet. I could do a keyboard video uh, network, a, a VNC, terminal services, full desktop, mouse, keyboard, full interaction. It could be ransomware. It could be a rootkit, a pivot. OK, I actually have to spend one and a half days on payloads on the certified ethical hacking course. It takes a day and a half to cover the basic payloads because the remote code execution, the SQL injection, that's, that, that's just a delivery mechanism. What a hacker really does, what your IOCs and TTPs can be seen, are the payloads that they install. Payloads help hackers accomplish their mission. They do something the hacker wants to do. The IOCs that we look for, lots of them are payload IOCs. And the payloads that we can have, there are lots of them. The most famous one is a backdoor. It gives me remote access to your computer. And there are some simple payloads and some advanced payloads. Backdoors are some of the most useful ones. It allows me command line access to your computer teeny tiny bit of code, if configured correctly, gives me command line access to your computer, such as, let's do a quick demo of a payload, a really old payload, one of my favorite old payloads. It's a payload called Netcat. Netcat, teeny tiny bit of code. This is my target system, my domain controller. If I could get a piece of code onto the domain controller, then I could remotely access it. If I remotely access it, I could do all sorts of things. Steal your data, steal your passwords, create user accounts, cause havoc. But the first thing I need is remote access. So, Blue Peter style, here's one I did earlier. On the C disk drive, there's a little tool called Netcat, and we still need to deliver that, an exploit would deliver it for me, but I'm just doing a demonstration of the payload by itself. What does a payload do? Well, if I run a command prompt, jump into the right folder on the disk, I can run the netcat payload. And what I'm going to do is stick netcat payload in a listening mode, port number 12345. I'm going to make a telnet session available and I'm going to execute the command prompt. So this is me setting up an open port listening for a connection and if somebody connects to this listen port i'm gonna give them the command prompt if i run it okay it sits and it seems to hang right but it's not hanging it's waiting for a connection i can go to a hacker's machine remotely clear that off oh come on click on the screen clear that off and I can now do an nmap to the target IP address on port 12345. And what do I get on a Linux machine? I think this is cool because do you want me to see me upgrade Linux? What do I mean upgrade Linux? No, nothing, he means. 
something didn't work on that command. It should have connected to 200.1. And I bet you I know what's wrong. I bet you my IP address is wrong. So let me just configure my IP address again. Let me just clear that and try it once more. So I want to do the end map. So let's try it once more. Ah, nope. So something went wrong on this side. I obviously did the demo too quickly. OK, let me just see. Can I ping the machine to make sure it's there? Yep, it's definitely there. So if it's there, I did a typo on this side. OK, netcat minus listen minus port one, two, three, four, five minus T minus C. Nope, that looks good as well. Let me just kill it. Try it again. Netcat minus listen minus port one, two, three, four, five minus T minus C, CMD or XC. Run that. That should be listening. Let me just check if that's working or not. I can check if it's working by running netstat minus alpha November Bravo. OK, and that shows me all my listening ports. And I should have in here port one, two, three, four, five listening as an open port. There's it there. Can we see it there clear as day? Looks to be working to me because that's it here. Netcat listening on port one, two, three, four, five, which means I should be able to connect to it. Let me jump back into my hacker box and I'll try my connection once more. The mouse seems to be a little bit floaty in this machine. This machine might need bounced, to be honest with you. Let's try it once more, clear that. So I'm going to run uh, netcat uh, 192, or I can also run telnet. Let me just see if a telnet works instead of netcat. Telnet 192.168.200.1 port 1.2.3.4.5. Aha, you see this time it worked. You can see I've got a Windows command prompt on a Linux machine. I can't do IF config, I have to do IP config. And look, what you'll find is in this window, it's 200.1. And in this window, oh, in this window, it's 200. So you can see two different IP addresses in two different windows. You can see my computer's 200.100, but this is a remote connection to the other computer. I have a back door in the other computer and I can look at your hard drive, whatever I could do at the command line, I can now do remotely on your computer. Okay, this was a very rapid demonstration of a back door. A back door helps the hacker accomplish their goal. To make sure my next lab is going to work, I'm going to restart this machine because it's been hacked. It's a non-persistent attack, which means when it's rebooted, it's clean. I could have made the attack persistent, but I chose not to because I want to do another demo. OK, so we are looking at a rapid run through of the hatch. Here. Don't forget five days it takes you to cover this properly on a certified ethical hacking program, but we're trying to give you a feeling for it. So what we've just done is a payload and we used a netcat payload on the system. Recon vulnerability exploit payload, we are nearly ready to do a hack because there's no such thing as a hack. A hack starts with reconnaissance then goes through vulnerability analysis. The vulnerability is weaponized into an exploit. The exploit is used to deliver a payload, and it's the payload that accomplishes the hacker's goals. Little problem. How's your coding? Because as you see, this is all code. The exploit's code, the payload's code, I have to write more code, attack scripts. I have to write code that takes the exploit, the payload, and the targeting data. And the exploit script has to write a script that wraps all of these together into a hack. Or I can cheat. I think I'll cheat. Because we have such a thing called a framework. 
frameworks are two types. You'll never guess what the two types are. Good actor and bad actor. Look, in all the books and all the exams, they call them black hats and white hats. I don't like the phrases black hats and white hats. You'll hear me referring to good actor and bad actor, but the industry still calls it a black hat and a white hat. We have two different groups, good actors and bad actors. We get two types of frameworks, and frameworks try to automate all of this for us, they bring it all together. We have to do each bit, but the framework helps us do it. The framework takes all the individual bits and writes the attack scripts for us. Frameworks. If it wasn't for frameworks, my certified ethical hacking course would be much longer and much more difficult. But we do have frameworks. Do you like my picture for a framework? Frameworks are the engines of hacking. Inside this, we have an ICBM. The ICBM is the delivery mechanism. The little bit in front's the payload. And somewhere in here is a little panel that folds down where you can type in your targeting data and you get a huge button, a huge button to launch. I've got my launch button somewhere, but I can't find it now. Frameworks are the engines of hacking. There are two types, underground frameworks for bad actors, commercial frameworks for good actors, bad actor and good actor frameworks. These are the metasploits and the core impacts. Metasploit is a bad actor framework, core impact is a good actor framework. Core impacts used by pen testers. It's a pen test toolkit. Core Metasploit is a hacker's toolkit. The good actor and the bad actor framework. And frameworks build the attack for us. On the bad actor side, we get Metasploit, Exploit DB, the social engineering toolkit, which I did a demo of on the first of today's session. So even if you're not interested in uh, root in to information security, do check out the YouTube video because in the first session today, we did a farming attack using social engineering. So you might want to check that out in our YouTube channel. So Metasploit, Exploit DB and set. And on the good actor side, Metasploit Pro, Immunity Canvas, Core Impact, Pen Test Tools. Pen Test Tools, Hacker Tools. It's always a lemon and us. There's always two sides to this one. Frameworks write the attack for us. Frameworks don't allow me to plug things in like Lego bricks. They allow me to do FUD, F-U-D. It's not fear, uncertainty, and doubt. FUD cryptors. FUD cryptors are what we're all terrified of right now. We're all terrified of a new strain of COVID, because we've been lucky up to now. COVID mutates. And so far, we've been through our Delta into our Omicron variant. And even the Omicron variant, the original booster jab, the original vaccine is quite effective. But maybe the next variant won't. If the virus changes enough, Antivirus doesn't recognize it. If I take an existing virus that you know the TTPs and the IOCs for, computer virus, and if I change it enough, I can create a new mutant strain. And a new mutant strain may bypass your antivirus. Last week, we bypassed Windows 11, the latest version with the latest security update, running the fully featured Windows Defender. Because we created a new variant strain. This takes the virus and it bypasses AV, IDS, IPS and firewall detection. It creates a new mutant strain of an existing virus. These are your hacking engines. They're designed to create attacks 
to bypass your controls. Everything we do, IOCs come in two flavors, indicators of compromise, signatures and artificial intelligence and machine learning. FUD does the same. They look at all the telltale signs, all the IOCs, the little indicators of compromise, and they change them. They obfuscate them. Obfuscation, obviously the goal of obfuscation is discombobulation. Are those beautiful words? Obfuscation and discombobulation. To disassociate, to hide, to disorient. We hide and disorientate from your antivirus, from your firewall, from your IDS. These are built in. How do you avoid detection? It's easy. You take your hand, you put it in your pocket, and you take your wallet out, and you buy it. You can buy evasion. They're built in to these frameworks that we use. The last part that we need is a framework. The reconnaissance, the vulnerability, the exploit and the payload. We did recon to find out the IP address and the port numbers. We did recon to find out it was a Windows 2003 computer that had FileShare. We know that FileShare works on 139 and 445. We know FileShare has a protocol called SMB, Server Messaging Blocks. We go and we look on the internet and Google. We look in the dark web. We try to find vulnerabilities on that system. And when we find a vulnerability, we want to know, has someone else weaponized it? Weaponization is incredibly difficult. You'll need object oriented and assembly level coding. So we look to see how all our people weaponized it, and we found they did. We found the exploit code, the weaponization of the vulnerability for MS 08067. And we can use that exploit to deliver a payload, a payload like a backdoor that gives me remote access. And if I know all that information, I can then use a framework like Metasploit to take all these parts and put them together to what we started with. A hack. Let's go take a check. Let's go and have a look, right? Let's go and have a look. And do you, do you like the short title? I'll give it a short title. This demo is a precursive NOP sled remote code execution buffer overflow of an RPC DLL of the server service in Windows 2003 uh, Service Pack 1 NX dropping a reverse Mapurter payload. You, you, you don't want the long title, trust me. <laughs> Look, it's only techno babble. It is just a recon with a vulnerability with an exploit and the payload wrapped up in a framework. So demo is almost an anticlimax because it's so easy to do. First thing I've got to do is to make sure my network works. So I'm just going to do a quick ping of the server just to make sure every if you can't connect across a network, you can't do a network attack. So that's just making sure it's working. So in here, inside Metasploit, now I'm using the graphic user interface. Some people will go and frown, but I am not a masochist. You know, if you give me a choice between lying on a nice, soft uh, memory foam mattress and a bed of nails, I'm going to pick a memory foam mattress every day. You want to use the command line? If you're a masochist, you work away. Leave me to my nice, soft, graphic user interface. Thank you very much. I'm going to attack Windows. These are all the Windows ports, the ports that we port scan during reconnaissance. And one of these ports is SMB, which is FileShare. And I have plugged in the exploit that we scraped off the internet, MS 08067. Now, it depends on how good I am, because I need to know exactly who the target is. And when you get a list of targets like this, you must pick the right one. There are reasons for it. If you know your assembly level, 
we're looking for the right ret address, the ep, and we're looking for the right scratch pad address. So the reason why we're picking these is to get the right assembly level, ret, ep, and the right scratch pad. But I just need to have done my reconnaissance correctly to know my target is a Windows 2003 SP1 machine in English. And the next thing I need to pick is a payload. And these are the big range of payloads. And I'm going to choose an advanced payload, the Mapurter payload. And there's dozens of different types of Mapurter payload. I'm going to choose a simple one, a bind. So this is going to be like the netcat backdoor with bells on, with lots and lots of bells on, lots of additional features. I need to then put in my targeting data. I need to know who my target is. I'm going to target 445. That's the port. We find that on a port scan. And we're going to stick in our targeting data of 192.168.200.1. Do you see all these advanced options? Dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Those are the ones you need to be scared of. Those are your FUD. Those try to make small, unique changes to the attack to do two things. A, break the attack so it never runs. Or if you're really lucky, create a brand new variant strain that bypasses detection. I'm not going to do that because I'm more than likely in a lab this quick, I'm going to end breaking the code. I'm simply going to put in my targeting data. I'm going to hit run in console. It's going to write me in this version, a Ruby attack script or the new version, a Python attack script, and it's going to execute the attack script. It's going to connect to the remote computer. It's going to connect to 445. It's going to use the exploit to deliver a payload. The payload is going to give me remote access to the computer. If this works without going to the machine, without any user doing anything, I get access. Remote code execution. Should we give it a go? My last demo took two goes for it to work. Anybody betting? Anybody want to gamble? Will it work or not? Should we find out? Let's run in console. So it's writing the attack. It's writing the attack. It's launched, 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 launched. Boom. Game over. That's it. I have remote act. Prove it, you say. OK, I'll prove it. Down at the bottom corner, this is where I type everything in. So prove it. OK. Do you want me to show you a screenshot of the computer I've hacked? That's a screenshot of the computer I've hacked. You want the passwords from the computer I hacked? I just do a hash dump for you. There's all the administrator passwords. On 500, there's the LM hash and the NTLM hash, which we can now crack. I uh, want a shell. We call this the courtesy DOS shell. This drop a courtesy DOS shell. Boom. Look, IP config. I'm on a computer called 200.100. I have complete control of the computer. It's only as good as I am on the command line. Bottom left hand corner, net user forward slash add inverted commas dns dash service inverted commas inverted commas p a s s w zero or d close inverted commas what have i just done i've just created a user account called dns services because it's going to appear in the log files people don't understand dns people won't know what it is net group inverted commas, domain admins, inverted commas, forward slash add, inverted commas, DNS dash service, single, yep, service single. Oh, no such user, made a typo. Okay, if you can't type, you can't hack, and I can barely type. Okay, DNS service, I made another typo. Definitely spell it right this time, is it? I've just created a domain administrator account. I just created on this machine remotely a user account called DNS services with a password. Oh, 
Oh, can't type. Don't you want me to want do I don't know what you want me to say. Patchy. Reconnaissance. Vulnerability scanning. Weaponization into an exploit. Payload selection. Wrapping up in a framework. Called hack. Remote code execution in this case. I have full remote access to your computer because of the hack chain and the framework that wrote the attack. The reason why lots of machines get hacked and the purpose of this, it's easy. That's the scary thing, it's easy. If it was difficult, no one could do it. If no one could do it, the likelihood of it happening, you would be really small. But it's not difficult. It's not difficult at all. It's actually really easy. And if you wanted to hack Windows 2011 desktop, the very latest version, you need a little bit of a budget as a hacker. You ain't gonna do it for free. But with a small amount of budget, exactly the same thing is possible on the very latest operating systems, on the cloud, on smart TVs, smart watches, CCTV systems, elevators, anything that uses the internet in actual fact. IoT, the internet of things. Today's session on our free trading January was called the Hatching. Learn to think like a hacker. And the reason why we learn to think like a hacker is to understand TTPs and IOCs. But when we decided to do this free training January idea, I really wanted it not to be a sales pitch or to be marketing. I promised people real learning. So I have tried to put as much as we possibly can into one short little session. I know for some people watching, this is the second of four sessions they're going to attend today. You're, you're hardcore. Congratulations if you're going to go for all four of these. I've got to present all four. But they're intense because they're supposed to be. Because it's about us trying to say to you, look, this is what we do. You can learn it and it's useful because you can use this to help protect your systems and to protect your network. This was the hatchet. Learn to think like a hacker. We are Nemstar. We are a specialized IS and cyber trading business established in 2009 in the United Kingdom. We have worked with some of the world's largest organizations and security agencies in trying to train them up and to help them enhance their capabilities in this area. If you ever want help in this, if you ever want support, we are always here and happy to help. Okay, you've got our contact details. But for me, but in this session, that's really us coming to the end. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask uh, Johan, is there any questions? Don't worry if your question doesn't get answered. We're going to go through them later tomorrow. We'll record any questions we haven't got answered and we'll upload them to our YouTube channel. So even if your question doesn't get answered now, it will be on our YouTube channel later on this week. But, Johan, Johan uh, any questions from that one? Yeah, we've got what have we got? One, um, from Benjamin. Unfortunately, he's had to leave the session, but I've told him we'll get the video later this week. Um, so in your experience, what's the main area that organizations fail to adequately protect themselves and that get exploited most often? In my opinion, they try to protect themselves against everything. They try to take their limited budget, limited resources and spread it such in a wide area that it's so thin that the weakness is everywhere. That what they don't use is threat intelligence. They don't think about what a modus operandi the attackers are using right now and concentrate their defenses 
unworthy attack. It's, it's like you've got, you know, a, a military outpost on top of a cliff. And, you know, you don't put your defences the same the whole way around. You defend the cliff side less than you do the land side because it's less likely and much more difficult for the enemy to attack. So trying to protect against everything usually results in protecting against nothing. Does that sort of make sense? Is there any more of those? Uh, no more questions at the minute. Anybody else got one they want to put in just before we finish up? Maybe anybody has a question on what to do next or things they could make courses or any free training tools online that Sean knows of anything? Maybe they've all just stopped using computers. <laughs> um, got one here from Nick. Can you recommend any good Intel sources for threat modeling? Oh, OK, so threat modeling is quite difficult to do. Yes, I could. Oh, what do you call them? Now, now you're going to ask me. I'll have to go and look it up. There is a, a good source that I use. And actually, I shared it with you, uh, uh, Johan, because it's, it's what we do, our updates on our LinkedIn profile. So one of the threat sources is we do regular updates of threat sources on our LinkedIn profile, but we ourselves get them from a different source. And what I'll do is I can't remember the name at the moment, but I'll put a post on LinkedIn indicating what threat sources that we use for threat modeling. I'll share that in our LinkedIn channel afterwards. Can't remember the name of the organization off the top of my head. Don't want to get it wrong. I'll is it Cyware Labs? It is Cyware Labs. That's one of them. Yeah, Cyware Labs. If you want to stick that, if you can remember the type and the name of it, you can stick it in the chat box for us. Good question. Okay. Well, I'll put a post up on LinkedIn on that one. We've got a, I don't know if it's a comment or a question, to be honest. Um, someone, uh, Alan has said, shortcut resolves as a map for me. <laughs> well, you, you, yeah, you, you know, Nmap is but one way to do it. The point is not Nmap. The point is reconnaissance. And reconnaissance is any possible way to gather information about a target. And we do, we defend against each layer. We should defend at each step. You should have controls and defenses, controls and defenses against reconnaissance, controls and defenses against vulnerability scanning, against exploits, against payloads. Every single step we need to put controls in. So Nmap's a great little tool. You can spend years learning it. It's a brilliant little utility, but it's only one of a thousand ways to do it. OK, uh, MMAP's really good. CEH program, we cover a lot of MMAP. There's more in CPENT as well. OK, I think that's really us out of time, is it? Um, if you've time for one quick one here, um, okay. Kevin said he's previously done the CEH course with you. What's the best way to keep it current? Is there refresher courses oh, or uh, you just do it all again? Not refresher courses. I mean, labs, the, the, the single answer to that is labs. So we now get a range of different online cyber ranges. So the ones that we use are, are from the EC Council. Uh, it's called CyberCube, but there's a really good free one available called Snap Labs. So if you do a little Google for the free tier of Snap Labs, one of the best ways to keep your hands open is, is to practice it. However, it changes so quickly, it's really hard to do. So there are other programs that go on from certified ethical hacking into different bits and pieces. But if it's the hacking stuff and the skills, it's having a good threat intelligence source and having a good lab source like a Snap Labs, the free version is quite interesting. CPENT is also the very advanced one after certified ethical hacking. Now that covers the much, much more in-depth technical attacks on it. CPENT. Uh, CPENT's exam is a six hour hacking simulation. We, we get six hours to hack six machines on a remote network and the result of your hack is the output of the, the exam results. So it's a very, very practical hands on CPEN for the next level up on that one. Snap Labs, if you want some practice and want to keep your, your skills fresh. Great, that's everything then. Um, just lots of comments saying thanks. Uh, people who are enjoying the session.
Not a problem, folks. Uh, we're doing a whole series of these today. I know some of you are in all four. Uh, feel free to go and have a look at our website if you haven't signed up to them all. There's two more sessions this afternoon, and hopefully there'll be some interesting stuff on both of those. But from me, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. You need any help or support, you know where we are. Love to see you there. See you later, folks. Goodbye.